Hello, San Bonani. Hello, how's it? Welcome back to part two of the Rumble in the Jungle, uh, the Communist versus uh, Liberals and Anarchist edition. Um, it's been lively, I think, in part one, which is perhaps the lion's share of the debate, as people sort of fleshed out their positions. Um, Others, you know, started setting out a few jabs here and there. I've seen some counter punches. Um, my ass being unfit, I've barely kept up. Just kidding. Stay calm. <laughs> um, but essentially, we've, we've started seeing um, the meat and potatoes come out of this debate. And I think in the closing 30 minutes of this conversation, we'll, we'll sort of go into areas where there's a bit of commonality, I think, that you may have also picked up. Um, but also certain questions that maybe have not been grappled with in terms of um, the one side of, you know, uh, the communist ideal, um, and maybe even on our side, right? Let's let's see what, what sort of happens. So welcome back to the debate. Welcome back, welcome back. As you can see, the panel is still here. It's looking a little morose. I think um, I denied them their cigarette break, so uh, they're a little angry at me. Just kidding. Everybody got a break, and I hope you got a break and you have a drink. Um, in front of you, fellas, let's, let's look to conclude our conversation. But in doing so, there is, and there may be people watching, especially the more guys on the, sort of the, um, on the communist side of the argument, you go, ah, you know, they're screaming at the screen because there's things that we're not saying or we're not dealing with certain questions that are asked and then we don't sort of answer those. So let me, let me go back um, to the more obvious one. Andrew and Mbiake, there is a common ground between the two of you that we, we've been teasing out but not saying overtly, the anarchist element of it, because if you're talking about a, a stateless, uh, moneyless, da -da 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 -less society, and Mbiake is articulating a similar vision, albeit through a different lens, where it's grounded in the rule of law and, um, and a free market, which also you concede, having come from a, classic, uh, from a libertarian, libertarian background, that you see the value of, I, I then want to understand why you head in the communist direction, which speaks to collectivist ideals, um, and where you abandon Umpiaki to a certain extent. What, where and why is there a difference between the two of you, Andrew? Okay, so from my point of view, the, the group is more important than the individual. It's that left versus right thing. The left is, is all about the group. The right is all about protecting the, the rights of the individual. And um, uh, as I said, communism is a value system. It It strives to to encourage people to value the right things whereas profit is currently being used as a as a sort of tool to get people to to value the right things through the invisible hand process and my argument is it's, it doesn't work it works to a certain point and then starts uh, pushing um, costs off as I say to the to the environment to uh, human rights and that sort of thing um, another point, sorry. Before that, sorry, because uh, I think you, you said something, but it needs to be interrogated a little bit uh, deeper. Okay. How do you miss dealing with a, a collective, a grouping, if you will, by not focusing on the individual? Or excuse me, by focusing on the individual. How do you miss um, the group or collective desires based on the fact that a group presumably are made up of individuals. Um, so if I focus on the individual, empowering the individual, make sure we as individuals and at the level of groups which I think really matter, like families for example, if those two, I focus on those those two, how do I miss the, the group then? Like why do you want to begin with the collective and and argue that somehow looking at the individual is problematic? Because I'll give that question also to Mpiak. Well, um, the, the free market system ultimately agrees that the customer is king. It doesn't always, again, it's an ideal and it doesn't always work that way, but customer is supposed to be the king. We're supposed to be the ones controlling society through our, our buying power, essentially. And um, But who buys stuff? The individual or a group? In other words, I, I, I don't know if it sounds like I'm sort of devolving into like a semantics thing, but I just don't see... So in a communist yeah. society, I, I work very much in an open source world, software world, and that's that's a very decentralized uh, community where where the community decides the direction of of the projects, and um, the individuals then are directly involved in in the running of of the the system. We vote by we vote through our skills essentially. We decide okay, this is worth pursuing. This is something worth growing we contribute directly to it as opposed to giving money and saying, okay, you guys contribute to that. I'm still a bit lost. I'm going to throw it to you. Mm -hmm. We'll come back. Okay. 
um, because I think what I'm trying to get at is where the, the, that that similarity I argued exists yeah, between yeah. the two of you. Where do you hear a difference? So uh, I would say, first of all, uh, I think we agree on a stateless society. That's uh, that is the most optimal thing to do. Uh, I think for I think for different reasons, you you value equality and democracy. I value uh, just people being able to do whatever it is that they feel they want to do. Individuals. So uh, I think there is no independent uh, thing called uh, uh, groups uh, as opposed to individuals because you know, like you said, stateless indiv- uh, groups are always made of individuals, mm. and so. Uh, way, as, as to the differences, for example, when you talk about a classless society, I mean, I, I assume that you are referring to some measures of uh, e- equality or inequality. And so for me, it's, it's not something that I really, I particularly worry about because as you as you yourself said, in your in the open source industry, you vote through your skills. So what actually happens with open source software is no noob is going to come in and say, okay, uh, I think this is the change that we should be implementing because, you know, I have an equal vote to everyone else. Mm. I- implicitly, I- I- or if not explicitly, the people who have more skills, more experience, they have a bigger vote than everyone else. And so that's like saying, okay, uh, your skills, uh, by the way, are correlated to how much money you earn as a software developer. Mm-hmm. So we could I- essentially replace the software, open source software and say, okay, you just pay into it. So that the people are not paying with money, they are paying with skills, mm. but they are, they, they are they, 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 they still in the economy there. And I think in fact, I think it's one of the best representations of, of free market capitalism mm-hmm. uh, it's because it's a system that uh, works independently. No one is regulating it, but it, it still works using free market principles. People are, tra- are, 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 are sort of trading skills, and everyone benefits from it. Uh, even if you're the best developer in the world, you will mm-hmm. still benefit from the co- cumulative efforts of everyone else mm-hmm. uh, putting into the community pool, like writing software and so on. And so I think that's the, that's the difference. I believe my, my values are the same as, the, as those of the classical liberals, where we differ is that... Uh, I, I, I think I take it to the logical conclusion where there is no absolutely no interference with the individual and what they want to do. The only, the only like, uh, and I also believe that the, the, the rule of law can exist without government. And now, how how you get to that is something that we can discuss. But I think there are in, there's enough historical precedent. If, if you look at things like um, how how the ori- the common law in, in England originally developed, and if, if, of course it eventually became a state thing, but it didn't start out like that in many of the regions of England. Yeah. Maybe then let me pose the question to you first before I come back to Gabriel and Andrew. Um, before the break, uh, and, and in part one rather, we spoke of the pathway from where we are now to, on the one hand, the communist ideal, right, of the stateless, cashless, um, blah, 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 ness. Sorry, I always forget the third one. Classless. Classless yes. society. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, like all of you bit my head off. <laughs> um, um, but there was a failure, perhaps, and I will give Andrew a chance to, to have a second bite of this apple. There was a failure to reconcile and answer the question of, in the march towards that society, an anarchist, essentially, mm. society to an extent, how do you view the disagreements that may happen in that situation? On the one hand, Andrew said, no, 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 because you, you, the, there is the direct democracy, the, you know, which you call majoritarianism to a mm. large extent, the relationship between those who disagree with the majority, there can and will be a violence element to that because ultimately if the majority wants to have the minority agree in the direction that they're taking, how do you do that? Um, and I would posit perhaps yeah. that violence comes in here because one is exercising power over the other. And Gabriel went into a good definition of why this pa- the power dynamic mm. relationship here. How do you reconcile in the march to your anarchist society, explain violence, the relationship of violence okay. in to, towards that? So violence will still exist. So or, like, as, as, it, as it does now, by the way, across mm. every society, no matter how good the government is. And so violence will still exist. The only difference is you can take whatever measures you, you feel are necessary to protect yourself. Mm. And so, the, for example, let's give you a practical example. In South Africa today, uh, if I wanted to buy go to a supermarket and buy a gun now because I felt my life was not necess- was not safe. I couldn't do that. I had to mm. comply with the terms of regulations, go to the police station, fill an application, and so on and so on. And so the only thing that would be different in an anarchy so that says, okay, I can just get a gun from the market. Mm. So there will be violent people. I have to figure out how to defend myself mm-hmm. against the violent people. That's just the, the, the price of life, the, what of the cost of living. Mm. And so back to the point about environmental degra- degradation. So mm. if you look into it, the, the cause of that is, is something called the tragedy of the cost. Yes. Where where property is essentially unowned by anyone. Let's look at the rhino, rhino for example. Right. Rhinos in South Africa, in many cases, are essentially owned by the state, which means they are unowned because they no one no one takes 
let's say if if all the rhinos die, uh, no one has to bear the cost of that because government doesn't uh, be, the people who run government don't benefit personally from owning from losing or, or benefiting from this property. Mm. And so if it's if a rhino if 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 a rhino was owned by someone, let's say someone has a rhino farm and they are losing all of these rhinos, they will take extraordinary measures to protect their revenue. Mm-hmm. So because every own ownership of an asset always ca- o- o- always tends to incur liabilities. Mm-hmm. So, so if someone is willing to take that on, then the, that's the best way to protect any asset because someone knows, okay, if if, the, if this as- asset gets wasted, then I lose out. If, if, if it's not wasted, if it's conserved, and then I can still provide my prov- product to the market, then I, I maintain my revenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see that same example in land. I want to come to you, Gabriel, on this. In land, for example, I mean, you and I come from uh, arguably rural parts of of KZN, Mm -hmm. most of which belongs to a a government, essentially. Mm. Uh, And you you see that tragedy of the Mm. commons where, you know, if I have a thousand cattle and no one owns the land and I just want, you know, freely let my cattle roam and overgraze in that part of the world and I degrade the soil and suddenly it's not as useful... I bear no cost to that because yep. I don't, you know, it's not my land, it's owned by the state. Someone else um, has to, to, to bear the costs of, of repairing that. Um, but if I can fence off my piece of land to prevent your cattle from coming on my land, mm. I can conserve, look after, yep. use it efficiently. Um, I will let you rebut. I just want to bring in Gabriel because the, the, the original question was similarities but the mm. differences. What, what mm-hmm. are you hearing out of this, Gabriel? Yeah, so I think that um, in terms of the the potential difference between a classical liberal view and an anarcho-libertarian view on gun laws is maybe not as much of a difference as you think. I think that you could have in a well-governed state, particularly if it's like a more of a night watchman state, but also if it was very uh, socialist state, you could have quite um, open gun laws that yeah. would allow the purchase of firearms in a supermarket. And I think it's worth reminding our listeners that Switzerland is one of the more uh, socialist states, uh, basic income grants are are being rolled out. And at the same time, it's got one of the highest gun ownership rates in the world. Mm -hmm. It's relatively easy getting and keeping a gun there. So I think that question about to what extent does uh, a a well-governed state allow private citizens to play the state's role Mm -hmm. I, I, that would be the way of looking at it. The yeah. state's role is to protect people from harm. Mm-hmm. And uh, in some governments, they might say, only the police are allowed to do that. In other governments, they might say, no, everyone's allowed to do that mm-hmm. because you are, the, you, you are your own best guardian mm-hmm. and so you're welcome to buy a gun and protect yourself. I, think, I, think that, I don't think that that's a very deep difference. I think that both a state and, a, and an anarcho-stateless society can allow uh, high gu- gun ownership rates. I think mm-hmm. that um, there, is, there is this... There is just this thing to notice that um, uh, there's a deep difference potentially um, uh, when it comes to what grounds property rights. See, I see property rights as being grounded in violence. Uh, Another way of putting it is to say that if I own this cup, which I don't, this belongs to the Institute of Race Relations, and they're in a very communist way, inside of companies, inside of families, inside of Africa Burn, also inside of companies. We're very communist, we share with each other. Um, But if I were to own this cup, I'd have the right to sell it, I'd have the right to break it, no one would have any right to come and punish me for that. Why do I have that right? Is it the thing between me and the cup? I say no. I say that's an agreement, that's a norm, a robust norm, because it's backed up by Mm. violence, shared among the people in my community. If I break this cup or I sell this cup and it's mine and you try and sue me or, 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 or bring harm to me as a result, I've, I can appeal to the rules and say, no, this is why the rules say I've got this. And the government or whoever's got the, uh, the preponderance of violence on their side is going to side with me if they're doing their jobs properly and say, no, Sietle, you can't uh, steal Gabriel's other cup because he broke, stole this cup uh, because it was his in the first place. Now, that's one idea. The idea there is that property is first a relationship amongst people and then only secondarily a relationship that people have to objects. Because the, the relationship you have to the object, the relationship of ownership is grounded in your social relationship, mm-hmm. underwritten by the rule of law if it's being done right. The other idea is that the property relationship is essentially between a person and an object and only derivatively other people agree. In mm-hmm. other words, it's just true that I own this cup. Mm-hmm. That's something that's basically true. That's as true as one plus one is two. And then if society is doing a really good job, it's going to recognize mm-hmm. that fact and it might do so through a state or it might do, throw, do so without a state, as I think both of you guys think can happen. 
but uh, but that's secondary. The primary thing is that I own this cup because I have it. And the thought that possession is nine tenths of the law, you know, it's like possession makes for ownership. And John Locke does have this idea, um, and I think in this sense we share John Locke, and yeah. maybe we could all share John Locke, because he sort of starts out with the thought that if you find an apple tree in the wild yeah. and you pluck those apples, then they're yours. Yeah. If you mix your labor with something in the commons, then, then your relationship between you and that thing becomes yours. And why? He says, because God says so. And then you can do away with God, and then you could say it's because that is what is natural. Yeah. That is how lions and sheep and so on behave. I think that that's a mistaken view. Um, I think whether you are or are not religious, mm. and I'm, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I am a passionate defender of religious tolerance mm -hmm. and embracing the, the better angels of our nature. Mm -hmm. I think whether you are or you aren't, we should try to our best to define the basic sort of political ideas without appeals to the mystical, mm -hmm. um, because those aren't things we can all see in the same way. We can't triangulate. So without God, is it just natural? Maybe it is the way lions behave, but lions do all kinds of things that I don't like mm. in any case. So I don't see a very strong grounding there. And I do just seeing it being the case that real, to own something, to possess something, I've got this. Okay, I'm walking mm. around with it. I put it down, I leave the room, and then you take this cup and you hide it in your bag, mm. and I come back. If the rest of you are sort of on his side, then I would say I didn't own that cup in the first place. I just possessed it. Mm. If you don't tell me, he took it. But if that happens and you guys gang up and you say, no, man, you can't take that cup. That's Gabriel's cup. Then I would say, then I've got not just possession, then I've got real ownership. Mm. And that's something that's sort of a philosophical idea, but it is a distinction sort of that's not quite the mm. left-right mm. distinction, um, but it's quite a deep one. And I think it's very real in South Africa because in the rural heartlands of this country, for example, you find that people often have possessions. They possess their huts, they possess a few cattle, mm. they possess the right to, you know, they possess the woods that they can pluck to, to burn, they possess the water that they can take their animals to feed on, but they don't own it. And you can tell they don't own it because if someone else comes, if another bully comes who's slightly stronger mm. and starts taking that stuff away from them, there's no force mm. that gangs up and says, no, you yeah. can't do this and punishes you. And that's why banks... Uh, can't uh, finance these projects mm -hmm. because the bank wants to know not just that you possess this thing right now, mm -hmm. the bank wants to know that you robustly possess the mm -hmm. thing, that you own it. In other words, that if anything happens, the society has got your back and is going to keep it with mm -hmm. you. And so I think that this sort of Tea Party movement that came out of America, there's a libert libertarian, it's very close to the communist thing because they share this anarchist thing. And I think there's Look, maybe I'm wrong, but those are the reasons why I think that property rights as a sort of grounding feature of the state are about violence and about rules, and uh, they go one way or another. The relationship is essentially among us, and I don't want a stateless society because I think a stateless society is going to be one in which bullies, in which possession matters more than ownership, and when possession matters more than ownership, being a good bully matters more than being a good value adder. All right, here comes the deep water. <laughs> yes, we'll be okay. <laughs> so I, I, I agree with Carol. There is, there is this uh, disagreement on the fundamental meaning of what uh, ownership means mm -hmm. and uh, property rights themselves. And uh, uh, what I would say is that, okay, it, it might be, to, to, uh, whereas Locke might have ended up saying, okay, this is God or it's natural. Um, mm. Other thinkers have taken it further. If you look at the writings of Rothbard and uh, uh, Hans Hermann Hopper, for mm -hmm. example, what they have done is to show that uh, if you care about maintaining peace uh, among people. What is the most rational way to pursue that goal? And well, surprise, surprise, you come up with anarcho-capitalism just from assuming, making that assumption that everyone uh, wants to, uh, assuming that you want to maintain peace among people. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to look at what could cause conflicts, what could cause conflict because uh, uh, scarce resources, if, if, we, if, if, if we only, if two people lay claim to the same scarce resource, mm -hmm. then that, that is a potential cause of conflict. So you have to solve that problem. And then reasoning uh, on that basis, then you eventually come to the point, okay, the, 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 most, the most rational way to resolve this is to have a, a property rights defined in this way. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it, it's saying, if you care about peace, 
this is the framework to adopt. This is this is the thing about anarcho- I, I'm not bothered if there's no anarcho- capitalist. Okay, I am a little bit bothered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot bothered actually. <laughs> but the point is, I understand something. I think that uh, a lot of communists don't understand is that uh, I, I I can't force people towards this ideal. Mm-hmm. It's something that I just have to convince people of. Mm-hmm. Like it's a uh, it, it's will not be achieved through some anarcho capitalist party. That 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 itself is a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm. And so you it's it's only a matter of persuasion. So I'm, I'm pretty relaxed, and I think the best way the best way for anarchy for, for anarcho capitalism to thrive and to prove itself is to first have a uh, night watchman state mm-hmm. and then from that night watchman state we will have enough freedom i believe to people for be able to be to for, for this choice to be a viable choice i mean it's uh, especially if you are allowed to um uh, to succeed from that uh, society, particular society if you can succeed with your property let's say i own Two hectares in case it's ending. Like, it's okay, sorry guys, I'm out. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer part of this government. I won't use your roads. If I do use your roads, then I make me pay for it. We'll sign a contract. I'll tell you, you'll tell me how much I must pay to use your roads and so on. And so, this is, yeah, this is my view. Andrew, you've heard the um, assessment from the two gentlemen. Um, so, what then? I'll, I'll frame a question, then you can just you can open, you can uh, okay. go as wide as you want. Um, what then do you posit as to being that difference? Um, between you and Umbiak. Like how do Umbiak is sort of is able to <coughs> excuse me. Umbiak is able to clearly articulate the relationship between power and violence in the creation of that anarch, 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 anarcho capitalist society. But I still don't understand how an anarcho communist society comes to be because there's certain steps that you, you, you aren't articulating well for me. Mm. Talk to us. Um I definitely agree with Mbiaki that uh, a, a communist party is a bit contradictory it's it's a it's a leadership group that that contradicts the principles of communism we have to work as a, a complete society towards it and i think we we, we do it through uh, the free market system um your point was on um sorry what was your point again oh the the possession situation um yeah so from a from a communist point of view possession is is a a communal um uh, agreement, uh, sorry, not possession, ownership. So, th- th- does it not suffer from the tragedy of the commons that we just described? Wait, you're saying everyone agrees. So, I was saying uh, ownership requires consensus being the primary yeah, idea, consensus. some some commitment to yeah. the rules. But <coughs> as soon as you allow ownership, uh, if if I- the things that you are owning add value, mm. and if in owning the thing you can mix your labor with the thing to also add value. Mm then as long as you think people have different capacities for adding value and that things have different capacities for adding value, you're quickly going to find that some people are adding a lot more value than mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. And if adding value is then connected to gaining more ownership of more things, uh, which would be an effective, efficient way of doing things, mm-hmm. as the, the market does, if you want more things to be generated, um, you're going to generate inequality mm-hmm. of ownership, mm-hmm. uh, which, is, which seems, again, yeah. my thought is that as hard as it is to get to the communist ideal, let's say we're there, it's like a chicken egg on a, on a roof. It's going to fall away because if we all owned the same amount of stuff and we were allowed to gain more ownership on the basis of how much value we add, mm. then after 10 years, we would no longer be financially equal. We'd be quite unequal. Mm. And if you gave it 100 years or 200 years, more so. Yeah, yeah so... Um, the, the chicken egg example is, uh, I, I feel that, that that's very much a, an aspect of the free market system because we've got the financial industry and the legal industry, which their primary s- purpose is to balance this very delicate system. So it's interesting that you describe the communist system as being that way when, when I see it as an aspect of the free market system. But um, no, no, no. So what I'm saying about the, uh, the free market system when it's being run well is that it's the opposite to a chicken egg on the top of the thing. It is robust. Um, that means everything is uh, reinforcing self itself in, self, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. if someone goes and tries to break it or someone meddles it with it in a little bit of, wa- of a way, you it get a lot of pushback and you, get, and, and you yeah. get a rebalance. The balance that I'm speaking of is not a balance in, in equal ownership. Mm-hmm. That's clearly not balanced. Mm. Uh, the balance that I'm speaking of is more of a balance in peace. Uh, and in a balance in equal opportunities when mm. it's really being done well. Mm. And those are robust balances that I think are worth preserving. I think if you try and keep a balance in equal ownership, mm. uh, then that's not going to work 
uh, because uh, this thing is going to start rolling off. And then what you have is you need to reintroduce violence to go and take stuff from the people that have added more value and therefore come to have more stuff. Mm. And uh, so if you want the balance, if you want to preserve equality of ownership, you have to. Uh, that's a weird kind of balance to preserve unless you're prepared to to keep using violence again and again to reinforce it because it's not self reinforcing. Mm. Okay, I, I think I, I've figured out the misunderstanding here. From my point of view, it's not equal ownership. We don't all get an equal amount of, you know, divided Cups. stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's everything is constantly owned by the entire collective, and we agree on how that is used specifically with. So, resources. but then, what if I want to use this cup mm. at the same mm. time yeah. as in Piaki? We have or a, this road or whatever. Yeah. We have an agreement in place, and obviously, we bring that that to a committee, and we so say no one ever disagrees. There, there's no, of course, there's, and that's one of the big problems How of do you communism. Manage those the, the big downside of communism is the bureaucracy. The, it, it's, it's like running through treacle. It makes it very difficult, and I absolutely acknowledge that. And it's through decentralization technologies that we throw slowly work our way through that. It is Dude, possible. And I'm sympathetic with that view. I have spent quite a lot of time in Russia, and you will find a lot of Stalinists who say, the problem with Russia is that Soviet Union collapsed before internet became truly effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if only Stalin had internet and Wi-Fi and super fast algorithms to make computations, all illegitimate antisocial elements, all of these mm. sociopaths and psychopaths that want just to have more things for themselves would have been identified very quickly and eliminated very effectively. All market, all inefficiencies of pricing bread and bricks and so on. No problem. Computer, very quick, <laughs> work it out. <laughs> we would have killed all the bad ones and had a much more effective economy if only we had internet. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's very funny, but there's truth in it. <laughs> there's truth in it because it's a gradual pr yeah. process. You implement a decentralization technology here and there and there, and we slowly distribute. I mean, even in the free market system, we've got... Um, We've got, uh, what do you call it, like the Uber and that sort of thing, where we're slowly decentralizing. But that's not adding communism. That is making it more effective. But Uber yeah. is backed up by property rights. Yeah. You can't use Uber's app uh, if you haven't downloaded it through the proper channel. No, if someone that. advertises themselves as Uber and they're not Uber, then Uber can go sue that person. It's gradual And steps. every person who owns it's that car, steps. like you would, but it's, no, but that's not a gradual step. That is a gradual step to away from uh, a badly regulated taxi industry where the mm, government was mm, choosing mm, who gets mm, to drive taxis. Yeah. It's not a step away from free market yeah, economics. Exactly. Decentralizing the means of production is not necessarily to become more communist. That can precisely be by becoming more capitalist. You talked about solar panels on our roofs as a way to save South Africa from ESCOM's load shedding. Mm. Maybe that's a very good idea. Mm. I think it could very well be. Who are you buying those solar panels from? Yeah. Like Africa Burn letting them fall from the sky? No. But I Capitalists who have the market really incentive to produce that's more right. uh, product But I agreed stuff. with it. I so so I think so. I think that we, there's just a definitional issue, and maybe there's a point where we. This is a strong point of agreement. We seem to agree that there are various ways in which decentralizing the means of production mm -hmm. is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. I see it as being definitely a good thing when what it does is undermine an oligopolistic cartel mm -hmm. where big business and big government are in bed together to dig trenches around an already established thing and prevent new entrants. We totally agree on that. Right. And when you take a step away from that, I think you're doing a good thing. I just don't think you're doing a communist thing. I think what you're doing is relying on property rights more effectively to incentivize yeah. innovation so That's that right. people add more value to society yeah. so that they can get more money and get Get their faces on the cover of the magazine and, and in fact, so on. <laughs> in <laughs> fact, I think you could argue that uh, the the coming into being of the joint stock corporation was the free market decentralizing mm -hmm. uh, uh, the capital ownership, allowing more people to own capital and decide mm -hmm. what happens with it. And so, I, I think uh, I think we don't disagree as much as uh, I originally thought. I think me and you basically agree on everything. But I, I think w what you need to see is that the economic problems inherent with communism. Don't get they can't get solved by technology because the principles of of, of economics uh, don't, don't don't rely. For example, the pricing problem, mm. which is one of the big uh, pro economic problems with uh, communism, you don't solve that because they're at the root of that problem is the fact that people sub value things subjectively. Mm. So you, you 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 can't solve that through technology. You can't unless unless at some point you figure out how to read people's minds and plug it all into some collective hive mind. And how much 
with Stalin like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But ups and downs, assuming that people still have sovereignty within themselves, yeah. then you, you 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 don't solve any of the economic problems that's well, inherent. I think you're going to be... Quick, 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 quick yeah. uh, bookmark. We are running out of yeah. time. Okay. So I'm going to unfortunately give everybody 30 seconds to wrap up their final thoughts. Okay. Um, I'll actually give you a minute because you, you, you sort of... Uh, we were taking a lot of yeah, flack yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You could hear the sort of box about ding ding <laughs> at that moment. Okay, Andrew, last minute and then thirty seconds for everybody just to plug this. If, 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 if Andrew needs more time, he can take my time. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, the one thing I, I haven't mentioned is is human rights. It's absolutely well, at least for me, I think it's for most communis, uh, communists. Human rights is a fundamental foundation that we all need to work off of, and I think we all agree with that as well. Um, with the uh, I wanted to ask a question on what you guys think of the agricultural industry and how you feel. We produce enough guys, food guys, for 12 billion guys, people. Guys, guys, <laughs> oh, I really don't have time. Yeah. I, I really don't have time. Okay. Andrew, okay. what we can do is we'll definitely have you back, um, especially more regular shows, mm. okay. um, because I think you definitely contributed to the liveliness yeah. um, of the conversation. How do we find you on social media, Andrew? Plug your your uh, Facebook, Twitter, and the like. Open Tangent on, on Twitter. And yeah, find me on Twitter and you can trickle through via that. Awesome. I'll have that uh, de uh, details in the descriptor. Uh, Gabes, how do we find you, Holmes? I don't have social media, so I'll just say instead, as Thomas Jefferson said, I think if humans were angels, we'd have no need for government. Amen. But we ain't angels. I hear you on that. Um, Clear Cat, how do we find you, dog? Okay, we are not angels, but we have free markets. So at at two are they taking at, liberties? At, <laughs> at Turing underscore nineteen ninety one is my Twitter. <laughs> Facebook is just piakedamini, and then my website is piakedamini dot com. Awesome, yeah. fellas. Thank you so, so much for joining me on this two-part debate on communism versus classical liberalism slash anarchy. <laughs> um, and again, as I said, Brother Homie, thank you so much for coming through. We'll definitely have you on the show again. And thank you for watching this um, special edition, a special uh, long format of the Big Liberty Show as we brought you a rumble in the... Uh, I don't know what to call it. Liberal versus conservative versus anarchist versus communist jungle. I'm sorry. I'll find a name to call it um, in the descriptor. Thank you so much for watching the show. And again, if you are someone who um, agrees with Andrew, maybe you felt watching this like, nah, Andrew, you're not making the points you should be making. Hey, man, hit your fat boy up on social media at Big Daddy Liberty on Twitter, Big Daddy Liberty on Facebook, and of course, you'll find the Big Daddy Liberty YouTube channel. You're likely watching it off of this. Pop me a message and uh, come through to the studio. Let's have that conversation. Tell us what Andrew may have not said or what Biake said wrong or whatever the lads um, you know, said that you want to hash out in a debate. We definitely value the power of ideas here on the show. And unfortunately, as I always say on the show, and Andrew's right next to me to hear it, never trust a commie. <laughs> <laughs>